Welcome everybody, my name is Eruption Fang, and this is episode 3 of Genlock, titled, Second Birthday. So after a less than convincing look at what Genlock does, our characters are hesitant to join its program. Valentina gets her time in the spotlight this episode trying to pick a fight with Madrani, and saying how she's retired. Weller, on the other hand, is pulled into Marin's office where he is berated by her, and told that if his soldiers don't pull it together within six months, the polity will be completely pushed out of North America. And Weller returns back to everyone, where he gives my favorite line so far. I'm glad you don't blindly give trust. Sign of a reasonable mind. I love it. I love that statement. It's not funny, nor is it really memorable, but I think it's very fitting that I love that statement so much. He still does, in a way, ask them to blindly trust him, but it's not nearly as manipulative as other cases. He instead pleads with them, lays it out as it is. He needs them. They are pretty much, don't want to rule out any other potential future cast members, the only hope. And so he asks them to try it just once. Now, if I were them, that's still a deal I wouldn't be so keen on. Because trying it once doesn't matter if it fails, because you'll die. I know the scene works under the pretext that Sinclair wasn't actually Sinclair, which is why it failed, but it'll work with them, but still. So it of course works, and all of our characters start dicking around before training. What better way to test out the new Holons? A good old fashioned game of Capture, Capture the, the flag. flag. Very similar to last episode, I think this was a very good way of showing us how each of these three handle themselves in a combat scenario. Yes, they all kind of suck at the beginning and do the exact same things, but as it goes on, you see that McLeod doesn't ever learn. She keeps doing the exact same thing over and over, which is just running down a straight path and then getting shot. There's no real strategy, she doesn't know what to do, and so she keeps repeating her past mistakes. Ida, very similar to McLeod, also does that, but he does implement a different strategy. Once again, like the last episode, trying to take an obstacle down head-on by brute force. Unfortunately, it has yet to work the both times he's tried, but I think establishing that he's gonna be a bit more of the tanky character, and Valentina doing her assassin-esque thing, sneaks around and stealthfully tries to capture the flag. Once again, I think it does a pretty good job at setting up how each character tackles a situation, but not gonna lie, bit weird for the mech stuff. Valentina's stealthy thing is cool, but I don't know if it fits being inside of a 50-foot robot. I'd rather just see her human form go on some stealth missions, which I don't doubt the series will do. I mean, despite this being a mech series, I'm not that keen on the mech stuff. McCloud can't hack if she's in a robot. Val can't stealth as a giant robot. Ida can still do Ida stuff still. I feel it's gonna be like Power Rangers when the moment they get into the mechs to fight, it's just gonna be pure entertainment value. No explaining anything, you already got this set up, it is just time for action. But who knows. Anyway, Kazu, Val, and McLeod are not capable of succeeding and then Chase steps in to flex? Real talk. Chase didn't do anything that impressive or different than the other three. He caught a rocket and threw it back, but that was the only unique thing he did. I mean, Kazu tried using McLeod as a shield. All in all, he was just faster than the other three? Like, it makes sense. Someone who's just put on roller skates for the first time isn't going to be as fast as someone who's been doing it for four years. So yes, it makes sense. But I thought there'd be more to it other than he's just faster than the other three. Maybe some gadgets. Maybe literally anything other than his innate speed. Anyway. An oh-so-conveniently-placed training session lands them right next to a medevac where they can see with their own eyes the Union's handiwork. Dr. Weller delivers a motivational speech, a very realistic one I might add. He's not asking them to save the world, all he's asking is that they make a difference. Maybe make it easier for someone else down the road to finish what they started. Just try. Now, is this manipulative? In a way, yes. But it's not misleading, and that's the big thing for me. As far as we're aware, at least. He's simply showing them the truth about what they can help prevent. It's a good motivating factor. Now, the interesting thing here with Dr. Weller that I found myself questioning is whether or not he himself is Genlock compatible. Because during the time where McLeod was uploading her mind, he was describing it like he knew what it felt like, as though he had also experienced it. Yes, it could be for dramatic effect. Yes, Madrani or Chase could have described what it felt like. But the way the scene played out, it seemed like he knew from first-hand experience. Plus, he is the scientist. Not one that I would currently describe as mad, but he's got a few loose screws based on the way he was acting in the reveal trailers. With technology like this, you need to test it. And what better test subject than oneself? Especially if you're a little bit crazy. 
I mean, just thinking, how does he know the exact type of nervous system that is needed for it to work in the first place? Lab rats don't seem like the right test subjects. He also could have gone through a plethora of human test subjects, but that seems a bit dark and borders on the line of genocide. If you ask me, it makes a little sense if it's based off of his very own structure. It explains why he knows what to look for. It is his creation after all, as he likes to remind everyone. So for now, I like to think that he is Genlock compatible, because there is still a spare Holon that is waiting to be used. Seems like a good end of season reveal, or we could just get another A-list actor in here. Valentina. She had a much more prominent role this episode, giving us a little bit of backstory, some ideals, and a bit of her personality, which… kind of a bitch. Mainly because I like Madrani a lot more than I like her. Something I did find odd was Chase's reality check that he gave to her. What he said was not wrong, I'm not trying to argue his statement, but I find it out of place because Val isn't just a partier. She hasn't spent her whole life just partying. She's not oblivious to the world, she's fought against the Union, she's lost people, she's experienced what it's like. And so her decision of, I'm out, I'm just gonna go party, seemed like her going, yeah, I'm aware of what's at stake, but I don't care. It's her decision to step away from it all. But Chase's line to me didn't seem like it should have had that much of an effect on her as it did. Like I said, what he said was not wrong, but her ideals and how she finds war completely pointless, that people are the problem, to me didn't jive well with her change of heart in the moment. It was a weird reality check that I feel didn't fit the character it was given to. I think it may have fit Ida better given his insubordination, but Valentina is to say the least an interesting character. She seems a lot more street smart than anyone else present. McLeod had a lot of personality this episode, and by the looks of it, a lot of people, including myself, like her. And thank god, because there's a really thin line between a very likable, entertaining, and funny character, and an unbearable annoyance of a character. Thankfully, from what it looks like, for now, at least, she's the former. We didn't get anything regarding her backstory as we did with Valentina, but she at least managed to bring some light-hearted humor. I'm already really enjoying the dynamic between her and Ida. The manga joke was legitimately funny, especially because it was kind of racist. There's nothing really to say about her right now other than she actually is very entertaining and likable. Madrani, I will say, is still currently my favorite character. As expected, her being former Union did stir up a little bit of drama between her and Val. Within the jumbled yelling at each other, you can hear her say that she wants to be there, she wants to help to make a difference. And then she hits us with the not my union. Excuse me, hashtag not my union, thanks. And might as well continue to say this, the union's still not expanded upon. So it's hard to say what she means by not my union. Perhaps at once they did have ideals and laws that made sense, but now they don't. But we don't know anything about them or what they currently stand for. So right now, that line is kind of useless. But besides that, I still really enjoy her character. She seems extremely dedicated, and she really has a lot of faith in Weller. And once again, love her attitude. When talking to Val, she was still like, okay, you may hate me, but listen to what Weller has to say. It's like she knows she's not a people person and is aware she gets on the wrong side of a lot of individuals, and so she has to point them into the direction of more personable beings. As fun as McLeod is, and as interested as I am to learn about Ida, Madrani came from right under my nose, and I just love her character. I will say though, at points her acting did become a bit shaky. I don't know if it was the delivery, or it was just the line itself, but it wasn't landing all the time. And while we're on the topic of criticisms this episode, there was a very questionable sound design choice. I know, I'm shocked. I think this is the first time this has happened. When Chase was shooting the basketballs, they made the strange choice to add a swish sound, despite there not being a net. I mean, come on, that's so noticeable. Did no one question this? Maybe just add a net or remove the sound. You know, it's the friction between the ball and the net that makes the sound. Without a net, there is no sound to be had. Come on, Rooster Teeth, you're better than this. You've dumped so much money into this and you make an amateur mistake like that. Anyway. One story point I most definitely am not looking forward to is Chase's jealousy. I mean, it looks like that's what's being set up. It looks like Miranda and Brandon are now a thing and they want to tell Chase, but Chase being a little jealous has to mad dog him and flex. And it kind of baffles me because if I'm being honest, it doesn't seem like that unique of a story, if that is what is happening, of course. There's always the possibility that there's a twist, things may not be as they seem, or it's to push a different aspect of the story, which I'll get to soon. 
but from the bare basics of what's been set up. I'm not interested in whatever jealousy arc seems to be being set up. It's like, yeah, you were dead for four years and didn't let your girlfriend know, and you're gonna be mad that she moved on? Is that the plot point we're really gonna go with? On the other hand, however, it could be a scapegoat to push how it affects those who use Genlock. Because despite Weller and his constant praise for his program, there's always a catch. I mean, just listen to how Weller talks about Genlock. What is Genlock if not the next step in humanity's evolution? And you can be the first to see where it takes us. I hear almost the exact same thing at E3 by developers all the time. They tell you all the good things about it, what it can do, but they don't tell you why it's bad. You'll realize why something is bad once you've already committed. And I feel as though Genlock works in a similar way. These people are transferring their mind, their whole being, out of their body and into a completely different object. And there's no consequences? You see, I don't believe that. And keep in mind, we're already in theory territory. But I believe using it does take a toll on the person in some way, shape, or form. Currently, I believe more mentally. You see, in that way, Chase's jealousy isn't just some generic, oh, I'm mad because you moved on when you thought I was dead, but it's used as a tool to show Chase's devolution in how Genlock is affecting him and his core personality. If you can't tell, I really just don't want this to be a boring jealousy arc. That was really the whole purpose of this. All in all, last episode was still better, but this was still a good episode. Despite some shaky acting and questionable sound design, we got our characters in the Hollands, got a sense of how they handle combat, and inspired them to fight the fight. I'm hoping next episode we get a bit more on either Ida or McLeod's backstory. So until next time, I'll see you in the next video.